If you're a beginner in C-sharp, you've probably heard about reflection and maybe even seen some of it in the code you've worked in. But you might be wondering, why would I use reflection and what kinds of situations might it be valuable? My name's Nick Cosentino and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. In this video, I'm going to give you a little bit of a contrived example, but I want to be able to demonstrate to you that there's some situations where at runtime, we have more information about what we want to be doing with types versus at compile time. Now with the typing system that we have in C-sharp, a lot of what we're doing is forced into this compile time path where we need to know everything up front. And that gives us a lot of type safety and makes it so that the compiler can handle a lot of potential errors for us. But it would mean that we could be limited in some capacity when it comes to some runtime things that we want to do. Reflection can open some doors for us there. I'm going to walk us through an example that allows us to examine some type information based on some user input. If that sounds interesting, just a quick reminder to check that pinned comment for a link to my newsletter and my courses on Dome Train. And with that said, let's jump into the code. Okay, so I did mention that this is going to be a little bit contrived, but what we are going to do is make a little console app application that allows us to inspect the different types that we have available in our program. So all of these classes that I have on screen right now are pretty silly, they're pretty pointless, but they're just here so that we have some variety to work with and that way we can go ask for different things and see the different outputs. So I needed something to feed into the example here. And going back to the practical use case for this, if I asked you at runtime that I wanted to be able to look up what's available for certain types of properties, you can't possibly know that at compile time if I need to tell you that as a user at runtime. So it's just one type of situation, no pun intended, where I might want to be able to look up some type of information using reflection. If you stay to the end of this video, I'll explain to you the situations I personally use reflection all of the time. So these classes, like I mentioned, are really simple. For the most part, I just have a handful of properties declared. They're between strings, integers, dates and times. I just have some values on them as well. And then I have this one that has a method on it. As we go through this example, we can try playing around with some things, but I just wanted to show you that I have a handful of these classes that we could go inspect. Now, I'm going to walk us through this example program, and there's a lot of stuff on the screen right now, and most of it is just console write line stuff, so it's not that complicated. I'll explain the uh, reflection part. There's a bunch of console write line just because that's what we're going to be showing to the end user when we go to run this, and we will be running it and seeing what kind of information we get. So just to kind of jump through it quickly, what I'm going to do at the start is just ask for the assembly that we're currently running out of. So that's assembly get executing assembly. And the reason that I want to do that is because we're going to be asking the correct assembly for the types. From there, I'm just going to start this while loop. And what we're going to do is ask the user to input some type of substring that we can go match on to look up some types. So all of those types that I declared at the bottom of this file that we were just looking at, what we're able to do with this code is type some part of a class name that we want to look for. And as long as we get a partial match, and I'm making it case insensitive just because why not? If we get a partial match, then we can print out all of the information for that type. So the next part is that we're going to use reflections. We're going to ask that assembly for all of the types. And technically, I pulled out the assembly at the top here. I could also take a snapshot of all of the types because between these runs, so each iteration of the loop, the list of types isn't going to change. Cool, a tiny little optimization there. So all of the types is now going to contain all of the types in our assembly. From there, I'm just using link to go find the types that match just part of that substring with case insensitive comparison, and I'm going to put them all into an array. We'll print out how many we found, but then this loop afterwards is going to print out all of the information using reflection. And again, there's a lot of code, but most of it's just for loops and console write lines. But we're going to print out all of the information that we can gather using reflection. And I say all of the information, there is more information that reflection can provide us. So what I highly recommend is if you want to play around with something like this, Use the code that you see on the screen. It's really quick to be able to just ask for the type information to get the constructors. You don't need the rest of the code that I have here with all the loops and stuff. So there's, like I said, a lot of code on screen, but not a lot of it you need to be able to kind of step through the debugger and play with things. But there is more information that's available. For the constructors, I'm just going to print out the constructor name. And spoiler alert, it's always going to be the same name. It's just dot .ctor for constructor. And then I'm going to print out the parameters for the constructors. We're going to print out method information right after. So again, you know, method, uh, we're going to get the parameters out of that. We're going to ask that particular type that we're looking at for all of the methods. So this double for loop is just going to be able to print out 
all those details. We'll do a similar thing for fields and for properties as well. So the reflection pieces that are interesting, right? Get properties, get fields, get methods. Methods each have get parameters, get constructors. Constructors have parameters, right? So these are all just the parts of reflection, but they're pretty straightforward and pretty repeated across the different members that we have to work with. Like I said, the rest of it is mostly console write line. So let's go run this. Let's play around with that a little bit and see if we can tweak anything to get some extra details out that are useful to us. So the first thing that our program does is ask us for a substring. And I don't know if you remember all of the classes that I showed you at the beginning. I didn't expect that you wrote them all down and that's okay. One of them said Nick. So if I put Nick in here, there was Nick something. I can't even remember what I wrote and that's okay because that's why I picked a substring I only needed to remember part of the name, but if we look for this one, we can see what it finds. So it found one type, right? One types. That's fun to say out loud. Type zero. So the first one that we find is Nick's cool class. I should have remembered that. That's the obvious choice, right? But the constructors that it has, just the default constructor. So this single constructor, and I did mention that it's going to have a dot CTOR name, and that's because all constructors have that name. The methods that we can see are the do something method, so that's the one method I defined on this type. And the other ones are just kind of built in because every class inherits from an object. So I didn't go write all of these, right? That's just built in. There are no fields and there are no properties. And then our program just kind of starts from the beginning. What's another one that we want to look for? I think I added two that had dev leader in them. And I did because there's a whole bunch of stuff that printed out. I see dev leader class two. That means we should see dev leader class here. Kind of the same thing, right? You can see that there's um, properties now. So this one's interesting because properties, sorry, it jumped a little bit, but properties, URL and count. But look up here at the methods, right? There's a get URL and a get count. And that's because properties are in fact methods. It's just that it's like a syntactic sugar that we have in code that we treat properties as these other things that we don't have the parentheses to call them, but truly they are methods with a get and a set in front of them. And if we want to see what happens when there are no matches, I mean, look, there's nothing that comes back found zero types. So that's pretty simple, but what would happen if we wanted to go find some stuff with private information on them, right? So let's go see if we can tweak this a little bit and make it such that we get some extra details. All right, so what I'm going to be doing is adding binding flags onto all of these calls that we have for getting constructors, fields, properties, and methods. So these different members that we have access to. And I've defined these binding flags up at the top. So public and non-public. This one's the magical one that's going to let us see hidden things that we should not be allowed to see. But I'm also going to ask for instance and static. So what we're going to want to do is jump back down to those types right after I update some of this code. And then we're going to add some other things onto there, which should mean we wouldn't have been able to see them before. And now we'll get some extra cool details. So I've just got this spot and one more right here on properties. So now they all have these binding flags for us to work with. Now, if I go down here, let's say uh, I'm going to play with the dev leader ones because we can see two classes at the same time. I'm going to go ahead and make these private. So that's going to be a private property. I'm going to make this one a field actually. So we'll do a private count. I'm just going to have it set to be one. Uh, maybe we can do a public static method here. Why don't we do a private static method? That's a double whammy. Okay, so we have a method that's private static, so technically hidden from everyone, but it's static, so it's on the type itself. And maybe we can go add a constructor in here and we'll chain them together. So we'll have, let's do it on this one, on dev leader class. We'll add two constructors. One will be private and have parameters and the other one will be public and have default parameters. Okay, so I've just gone back to line 96 here. I've made the field just not have anything automatically assigned here, but I've added these two constructors in. This one's going to be public and have no parameters and it chains into this other private one that takes an account. So now we have a mix of things. We have something that's static. We have a bunch of private stuff. I have multiple constructors. We have a field that's private, right? That's kind of unique because this is usually a very hidden thing from us. So let's go run this again and see what kind of details we get now. 
Okay, I'm going to put in dev leader and hopefully we still get our two types back and we get tons of stuff coming out here. I'm just going to move this back on my screen a little bit so I can read it a little better. And let's see. So found two types, type zero, the first one. You can see that we get two constructors now, right? And from there, we have the count on the second constructor. And recall that one of these was private, right? This is the private constructor. We shouldn't really be able to see that, but reflection lets us do it. Now, when we look at the methods, we have some extra things things and I don't know if you were paying attention close enough before but member wise clone and finalize were not things that were showing up for us so that's kind of cool and what else do we have here so we have the get URL let's jump to the other one that's down below so we have a field that comes back now right we have underscore count that is a field that's really cool and we can see this method too this is hidden this is the static method that we added so this is a static and private that's showing up now so this is really cool that we're able to make a couple of tweaks and we can get static, we can get private things, we can get instance things, we can get the public things. That's the public instance stuff I think is pretty standard, probably what you might expect. But the fact that we can get static and private is also really cool here. So that's just a quick little program that shows us that at runtime, if we had some type of request to be able to go look up type information, and that could be for any purpose, right? You might have different things that do deserialization. You might be able to have other systems that are connecting together and they're not able to have that information up front. You might have situations where truly based on user input, maybe not as contrived as the example I gave here, you need to go look up information. And if we don't have that all at compile time, because access to that information comes later, reflection can be very powerful. Now, I did mention to you earlier in this video that if you want to know how I use reflection all of the time, you can check out this video next. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.